Okay, well, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, I know at least uh, one person has mentioned that uh, she'll have to access the, the video, but um, this is a um, final class that I wanted to devote to some really important material um, for joy of abstraction and really important material for applied category theory and category theory more broadly. And that's the subject of natural transformations. And uh, in a previous class, I had mentioned that uh, it could be argued uh, that three the most core most central concepts in category theory are on the one hand, categories. Uh, secondly, functors map structure preserving mappings between categories and thirdly natural transformations which are these structure preserving mappings between functors more than that um, there are some who believe that there's a single most important concept in category theory a single most important sort of uh, type of formalism, it's that of the natural transformation. And uh, these are arguments above my pay grade, um, and uh, I'm not gonna uh, take, a, take a position on that, but it's um, there's no question that natural transformations are absolutely central in our work and application of category theory to our areas of health modeling. Uh, they come up ubiquitously in things like uh, the homomorphisms between stock flow diagrams. Um, because stock flow diagrams, as we've described, are, can be characterized as functors, functors from a schema category to set. And if we have one stock flow diagram, it's a functor, it's one functor from the schema category to set. If we have another one, it's, it's another functor. And homomorphisms between a map structure preserving mappings between these stock flow diagrams, for example, are natural transformations. They, they map one functor to another in a way that preserves the structure of those, those functors. So in our work, as well as you know, broad, or broader applications of category theory, natural transformations are everywhere. Um, there, we see them ubiquitously, and we have to uh, manipulate them ubiquitously. But they have this curiously opaque feel for many people coming to category theory for the first time. It's a layer of abstraction atop these these earlier layers of categories, and functors, which test many students. It certainly tested me. You know, it, it gave me a lot of trouble when I first saw it expressed symbolically in Barn Wells. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, that's a regrettable thing, how it's a stumbling block, because um, in so many ways, like many concepts in category theory, there's just this wonderful intuition. But more than that, they, they relate to, to the types of concepts that we see in daily life notion of translating between maps. Um, we have a map done by two different cartographers and locations of cities in the ancient world, and we plot them on a common map. We might say, well, this point here in Strabo cor uh, corresponds to that point there in Eratosthenes' map. Um, and, you know, this road there and, and Strabo's map corresponds to this and er this road and Eratosthenes' map. These, we have these sort of ability to relate these maps. And, and in some ways, that's what natural transformations are. There, there's a lot more to it, a lot more rigor to it. But there are ways of, of relating the maps that capture common, common structure, and preserve that structure. Um, Eugenia Chen comments that these 
constitute an appropriate, they give an appropriate notion of relationship between functors, between these structure preserving mappings themselves between categories. Um, that gives us our first glimpse of two-dimensional structure. They, they, they whisper to us of these, these higher categories where we not only have objects and relations between them, but we have relations between those relations. So, you know, I put down some central themes here, natural transformations or structure preserving mappings between functors, which hopefully should give you a, a sort of um, feeling of, of comfort. You know, uh, it's turtles all the way down. It, it's sort of this notion of structure preserving mappings that we saw within a category and sort of um, the, the morphisms linking up things when we say a category of X, a category of stock flow diagram. For example, um, when we have um, more reason about functors mapping one category to another, being structure preserving mappings, we see the same idea here. And when we say structure preserving, we can be more specific about it. I think these mappings between functors, mappings of how one functor maps things versus how another functor maps things into that same destination. Those points on the globe, common points of the globe. Uh, we talk about structure being preserved if it, if it satisfies a naturality condition involving how it maps each and every morphism from the source category. Um, uh, that we have this naturality square satisfied that it commutes for each and every source morphism. And at some level, you, know, it, you have to realize that natural transformations between functors are not to be taken for granted. They're not insured between two arbitrary functors, not at all. When they exist, they're very strong. They're an indication of a very strong sort of compatibility, as it were, between these functors. It's not to say that one functor is the same as the other. No, 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 no. But but they're in some sense compatible. They're in some sense, um, uh, they tell, they, they share a lot of common structure. And in fact, the existence of a natural transformation is a very powerful statement about the deep relationship. So it's a special thing when we have two functors related by a natural transformation. Uh, it, it reflects a certain kinship of those functors. Um, now, as it turns out, in the functional programming world, in the world of software engineering programming, natural transformations are also extremely important. It shouldn't surprise you at some level that, that category theory provides this amazing way of identifying these powerful reusable abstractions that come up in programming, whether it's lenses or functors, you know, cases where pre-orders, monoids, all these constructs, and even higher things, you know, uh, different types of optics beyond uh, lenses, prisms and ISOs, for example, um, or pro-functors. These are concepts that monads, um, uh, applicatives. Um, these are concepts which, in some cases, were created um, uh, sort of informally as idioms within, particularly functional programming world. List packers, etc., created them, and but they have this formalization, these deep roots in category theory, and so it is with with natural transformations. Um, we could think of them as if we think of a functor as mapping types to types, you know, so ints to lists of ints, bools to lists of bools, doubles to lists of doubles, for example. And we have two functors, maybe one is list, one is maybe, maps systematically in this way. 
uh, natural transformations provide this way of translating between them that is given by what we call a polymorphic function. Um, and they're in some sense orthogonal to functors. Uh, a functor through FMAP, through by lifting morphisms, morphism from ints to bools can be lifted to one from lists of ints to list of bools. And it doesn't change the number of things in the list when we apply it, when we map it over this list of ints. We get, if there's 100 ints in that list, in the source list, we'll get 100 bools, 100, 100 bools in our target list. It, it maps the type of contents ints to bools without changing shape. And natural transformation, it changes shape. It goes from a list to a maybe, for example, or a list to a tree. It doesn't change the contents. It just repackages them. It goes from a list of ints to a tree of ints or list of ints, uh, for example, to a to a to maybe event or or what have you, a maybe event to a list event. Um, so it's orthogonal um, from a programming standpoint. Works at right angles to the uh, uh, to functors. Uh, it gives a way of translating between functors, lists to trees. Um, and uh, it turns out that it's it's very useful since. Category theory is it's about the joy of abstraction. It's about being able to work and go from different levels of abstraction where needed, just like software engineering. It's in our interest to be able to work with, with code in the small and then zoom out and see the architecture writ large, for example, not have to worry about what every function, or, you know, how every function works simply reason in terms of its specification. It's what it does, not how. Uh, so it is with, with category theory. We're, we're zooming out from dealing with a category that represents a particular pre-order to a category where the objects are different pre-orders and, and the morphisms are, are maps between them. And here, um, it's useful to to be able to think of a natural transformation on how it operates on the functors, how it translates one functor to another, just like that, saying, well, Strabo thought this city was at this point on the earth. Eratosthenes thought it was at this point in the earth and relating the two. Um, think about that city by city or think about how the functors map particular objects and the links between them, um, the components of the natural transformation on the one hand, um, versus being able to zoom out and just saying, oh, we have a category of functors. Each object is a functor, and each morphism, and the morphisms between the functors in this functor category from C to D, from a fixed source category to a fixed target category, the morphisms between functor A and functor B are natural transformations. They structure preserving mappings from one functor to another. One of the most powerful illustrations of this, I, I'm, I'm rather taken by, you know, was illustrated better than anyone I know by by uh, Bartosz Milewski, um in uh, in that MIT course, uh, IEP course on programming with categories, uh, where you know he talks about a, a source category being mapped into a target category um, by a functor f and a functor g, and you remember functors map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. And he drew ways that two different functors, F and G or, or respectively, map these objects in the source category and these morphisms shown as lines here. And of course, this is notional. It's, it's sort of a, it gives a graphical view, but you know, A, this, this object here in the source category is mapped to this object here in the target category, which kind of looks like a head, the way that, which it's drawn. This this uh, line here, going from kind of the, as it were, the torso up to the head is 
as mapped into this line, this this morphism. Um, this uh, this object here is mapped to kind of a hand object over here in the category by category F, right? And so this object is mapped to there, the torso object is mapped to here, and there's a morphism between them in the source category that's mapped to this morphism. That's what functors do, right? They map objects to objects, morphisms to morphisms in ways that are guaranteed to preserve identity and preserve composition, right? Um, we, we should be comfortable with that notion, right? Um, functor, one functor F maps objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms in ways that preserve identity and, and, and uh, composition. Um, you either compose in the source category and then map over, or we can map over and then compose. But here, we don't just have that functor. We have a functor G, which maps the head object to a rather unpleasant looking head of a, it's supposed to be a dog. Um, and it maps the, the torso um, object over here in the source category. Instead of mapping it up here, it, it maps it into the torso of the, the dog, right? And it maps the hand of the source category to the paw of the dog, P-A-W, not P-A-S. Um, and, and this neck morphism up here in the source category, it's mapped to this neck, right? Um, this arm morphism, as it were, is mapped to the leg of the front leg of the dog, the foreleg of the dog, right? Um, so these are two functors. They each are structure preserving mappings that map from a same source category, from the same source category to the same target category, but they map it to different places, right? But each is a structure preserving mapping of this source category into this category. It embeds it at some level, right? That's what functors do. They're each going from the same source category to the same target category. That's what we're going to be dealing with throughout this discussion of natural transformations. That's the only way we could translate between functors if they're going from the same source category to the same target category. So here we go. Here's one functor's embedding of this. Here's another functor's embedding of it, right? What a natural transformation does is gives us this Rosetta Stone, as it were, that that tells us how to translate from the first embedding, you know, from embedding given by F of this source category in this target category to the embedding performed by G. Tells us, look, the natural transformation tells us, well, uh, a head, uh, the head, uh, which is up here for the person, maps down to the head, this head for the dog, right? The the torso for the person maps down to the torso for the dog. The hand for the person maps down to the paw for the dog, right? Um, it gives us that, but not only that, right? Um, it's also going to map down the morphisms in ways that are consistent, right? And we'll come to that in a second. But it's important to realize that it's this kind of Rosetta Stone it relies on there being morphisms that are in this target category already. So there's saw morphism in this target category from this head to that head. And it says, aha, that's the morphism. That's the Rosetta Stone morphism that goes from the head of the human to the head of the dog. There's this one from the hand of the human to the hand of the dog. The natural transformation gives you that way of translating the objects here to the objects here. But more than that, it translates the morphisms. And, and this is important in ways that are that are that are that have this guaranteed kind of coherence, this guaranteed consistency. So if there's a morphism F, let's say it's the hand morphism here, um it can't be mapped willy-nilly um down to some morphism here. It has to if if it goes from from the lifting of a and b by f by by functor f here going from these two um it of course it has to now go from what 
the so if if it's going from the torso to the hand of the person, it, there's also a version of this 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 uh, uh, arm morphism uh, down in the dog, and we need to have a consistency between them. So just like with functors, we could either compose and then map or map and then compose. It's a similar idea here. If, if we're considering where F is mapped things to, we can either first go down, follow this Rosetta Stone translation from the head to the head, or, or let's say from the torso to the torso, if we're dealing with the arm, from the torso to the torso, that's this one here, let's say. Um, and then we we can go follow the, the arm morphism and get to where the paw is. Or we can go on the arm of this person, go along the arm, and then map down the hand to the paw. So you see, we we can either do the job, you know, we can either map down and do the job in the target category after that, or we could do the job here following the morphism and then map down. Either way, we get the same thing. So we can either follow this component of the natural transformation, which we'll call alpha for the source, the head to the head or whatever, the torso to the torso. And then we can follow the arm or we can follow the arm in the human and then follow this map down to the paw, from the hand to the paw. And it's got to be the same. It's got to commute. We have to get the same results either way. That's what it means for them to be consistent, for F and G to, in some sense, play nicely with each other, be very consistent um, to, to have the structure preserving nature. Um, that That's what the natural transformation is guaranteeing, that we can do it either the source side and then map over or map over first and then do it the target side. If that reminds you of functors, it's for good reason, right? You can either compose on the source, map over um, with the functor, or we could map over um, the functor and compose in the, in the target, yeah. So this is naturality square. Um, if we have this, remember we're, we're dealing with natural transformations between two functors, which are from the same source category to the same target, here C and D. So we have functor F and functor G. Mm -hmm. And again, either we can, if we want to consider F here, Either we can map A over and uh, and then uh, lift it with, uh, and then follow how F is lifted by capital F, functor of capital F over to F of B here, and then go to G, or we can go to G first and then follow how G maps F over here, and we have to get the same result. I, I, I illustrate it with somewhat different nomenclature here. And the key thing is that this has to hold for all Fs here. So for all these morphisms here, you have to have this nice way of translating from F to G that has that guarantees their consistency, right? This, this natural transformation provides a systematic Rosetta Stone to translate from F to G that guarantees, guarantees that you can either do things in F and then translate or translate first and do things in G and you get the same result for all of these different morphisms, every single one. You, you gotta have that property. You gotta have that property. And so, so it is here, right? For every F over here. Um, now, a thing about notation. Um, it, well, I should say, so if we have multiple Fs here, we have to have this naturality condition for every single one of them, right? Um, we have no wiggle room. Um, uh, you know, the natural 
the 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 uh, natural transformation has to handle each and every one of these and guarantee that they're, they're consistent. I hope you're starting to get some flavor as to like why natural transformation, the systematic way of going from one functor to another, has such a strong, um, uh, it's is 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 a very strong condition of consistency that F and G are in some sense very compatible. As we'll see, they they won't necessarily be the same. I mean, maybe that G is much more coarse grained. You know, F allows us to have lists of integers, and G is just a a maybe. But the natural transformation maps between the two in ways that are totally consistent. It's not that G is the same as F. No, no, no. It's it's keeping a lot less information. Not not a whole list, but just this, just this maybe. This is maybe one value or zero values, but it does it in a way that's so consistent with the original that it's it's very powerful. You know, the, the empty lists go to nothing in the maybe, and, and you know, um, otherwise the list only takes its first element. So, so this is um, this is. I hope you're starting to get a sense of why it's it's such a strong condition. If you can do this between these two functors, they're in some sense deeply compatible. In um, some sense, they play nicely. They, they capture a lot of common structure, even if one's a lot coarser or you know, a lot more limited, a lot more um, a, a lot more abbreviated. Um, they capture sort of common structure. So I want to talk about notation. So. Um, notation is, we in category theory, when you're first coming to it, you'll you'll see, um, you'll often be overwhelmed by, by this notation, that semicolons and circles and all these different letters and epsilons and deltas and um, etas, etc. The longer you spend with it, you, you start to realize that, oh my goodness, this stuff is reused again and again in very in, in ways that are consistent. So when you see an eta or when you see an epsilon, you know what how it's functioning because it's like, oh, that's the normal epsilon. That's the normal eta. Um, now, for natural transformations, there's a convention used. And natural transformations are almost always written with Greek letters. So you'll notice this. Now, the important the important thing to to recognize here is that this Greek letter is it's called a component of the natural transformation. That Greek letter is so for mapping in the functors from a source category C to target category D. Hmm. Hmm. So maybe these are like ints and bools and so on. And this is maybe list events. Maybe this is maybe events. But for, for, I've got that mapping over. Mm. Um, uh, and we have this morphism in the target category. Maybe it's from lists events, lists of bools. This morphism in the target category. Um, that's a natural transformation. So this would be... Uh, a component of the natural transformation, alpha sub a, be uh, maybe it's mapping list events to maybe events, and it's a it's a component that applies to ints. That's what the a is here. How a got mapped by list compared to how a got mapped by by maybe the natural transformation component labeled by the source object over here in the source category a. That's what A is, right? It's the name of this over here in the source category. And there's one of it for every one of these. There's a similar one for B. It's going, telling how B is mapped by F versus how B is mapped by G. That's what we're doing for A, right? How A is mapped by F versus how A is mapped by G. But this has to be a morphism in this target category. It's not like we create a morphism. It's not like the natural transformation conjures it up out of Thin air. No, no, no. This is a, the the natural transformation identifies in this target category. Ah, there's a, there's this kind of Rosetta Stone for translating from list events to to maybe events. 
maybe it's going to be called safe head for us. It takes a list of events and gives us back a, a maybe event in this way that true to the structure. Um, so, so it's some pre-existing morphism in this target category that serves as the component, this kind of Rosetta Stone telling us how we go from how, you know, from how F maps A to how G maps A. And similarly, we have that for every object mapped from here in the source category. We have this way of translating from how F maps it to how G maps it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have one of these naturality squares for every for every app you know, that can use. Um, so it's it's worth emphasizing that um, we have these we have these uh, natural these components of the natural transformation for every object in the source category. Let's say, how does functor F map it? How does functor G map it? Mm -hmm. Kind of it translates this word in Farsi to this word in Chinese and what have you. Mm. Um, right. And I said this, we have a naturality square for each and every such um, such morphism. Now, Bartosz Miljewski has this wonderfully evocative you know, illustrations. Uh, earlier, we saw it with the translation from the, um, things mapped onto the human to things mapped onto the dog. Translate from the head of the human to the head of the dog, or the, the hand of the human to the paw of the dog, and in ways that are all consistent with the connectivity, arms, and necks, and that sort of thing. Another thing he he likes to talk about is how we could think of functors as kind of mapping a source category onto kind of a sheet in the target category. So one functor maps it onto kind of one maps A, B, C to in each of these source objects, remember, onto a corresponding source object on some sheet in the target category. And the other functor, G, maps each of these source objects onto a, a different sheet in the target category. So we have the kind of sheet for F, and we have kind of a sheet for G, you know, functor F has, it's embedded these things over in this one, including these morphisms, right? Because functors map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms and ways to preserve identity and composition. So we have these sheets of where it's mapped each of them. And what the important thing here is that Bartosz emphasizes that you can think of a natural transformation as running perpendicular to these sheets, running kind of orthogonal, right? Sort of, it's not within a sheet. It's translating between sheets, right? Trying to go how how F has mapped B versus how G has mapped B, or how F has mapped A to how B is how, how G has mapped B. So you can think of it as kind of running between sheets. So functors kind of map over these things within a sheet that's consistent according to the rules of functors, right? Um, and, and each functor is this kind of sheet that it's mapped onto, and these these natural transformations are orthogonal. And as as I mentioned earlier, we'll see that when it comes to programming, they very much have this feel of being orthogonal to functors. They they do things that are kind of at right angles, to it, independent of they they operate in a different way. Again, in programming, functors map content but preserve um, so they, they they map content but they preserve the shape so they a functor will lift a function from ints to bools to go from a list of ints to a list of bools um and we could apply you know for a functor maybe from maybe events to maybe of bools they functors provide this way of changing contents without changing shape. And natural transformations translate between shapes without changing contents. They just repackage it from a list events to a tree events, for example, or from a maybe event to a list event that has the same content. Okay. Um, right. Um, so you may be wondering, like, what sort of thing what sort of thing do we have when we have 
programming. Well, you know, that that serves to, it's kind of it has this deep sense of consistency between functors. Um, it maps from one functor to another in a way that's structure preserving. Give me an example, right? Um, uh, well, I'll give you an example. You want an example? I'll give you an example. Okay. So here we're going to have two functors and, and we're going to be operating in, in Hask. And I, I've kind of taken liberties with this because I've, I've shown category C and category D because that's what we're dealing with in general with natural transformations. These functors map from C to D. Same C for both functor F and G and same D, you know, source and target way of translating in D, you know, um, between F and G. But here in, in Hask, we're actually going from Hask to Hask, right? When you list as a functor from Hask to Hask, it, it lifts ints, it maps, you know, int to list event. It maps um, bool to list of bool, right? Or, or it maps uh, and for the maybe functor, ints to maybe events, and, and bools to maybe of bools, right? That's what functors do in programming, right? Um, there be some. Uh, uh, parametric uh, parametric uh, data types, right? Parametric containers a lot of the time, although they're not always containers. Um, that's for, for many finitary functors, that's a pretty good rule. And here, so that's what functors are, just reminding us. Um, and remember, a functor has the ability to not only map Objects to object, like list to int to list events and bool to list of bool, but it has the ability to lift morphisms, right? It has this ability to, to, to map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms in ways that identity is in, in composition or, or preserved, right? That's what functors do. So a functor gives us in programming a way to map, a way to F map in Haskell. Um, morphisms in the source category in Hask, the morphisms are functions mapping from data one data type to another, from ints to bools. So maybe it's is negative, right? A functor gives us a way to lift is negative from lift is negative to apply on whatever the functor type is, lists of lists, right? It can lift is negative to go, so the funct, so if you give me a, a, a morphism, a, a function from ints to bools called is negative, um, I can then, the functor will map ints to list of ints, bools to list of bools, and I can lift that function is negative to go from list of ints to list of bools. That's what functors do, right? And what a natural transformation does is gives us this way of translating from one functor to another, the preserved structure translates lists of ints to maybe events, mm -hmm. list of bools to maybe of bools. Mm -hmm. um, and what is such a natural transformation? Well, remember it has components for each and every object in the source category. So. Um, there's an object in it as a component that says how to go from list events to maybe events. If there's a bool in the source category as a and as a morphism in the target category, it goes from list events to to maybe oh sorry, list of bools to maybe of bools. So there's these components. And what is it? Well, it's what what are these components? What are these function this is in hask as well so what are these these are morphisms in this target category the target category is hask so that go from a list event to a maybe event what is what what is the morphism what is the function from list events to maybe events that's part of this um, natural transformation that we're talking about well it's safe head it's going to take a list event and if that list has a first element in it, it will turn a maybe of that first element, sum of that first element. So maybe the first element of the list is 17. And, and if that's the case, 
we have a list and it starts with 17. Maybe it has lots of things after, maybe just a few. Maybe 17 is the only thing in it. We get back uh, a maybe holding 17, a sum, S-O-M-E, of 17. Mm -hmm. um, that's what SafeHead does if we have a list that starts with 17. If we have a list that starts with you know, um, 37, it'll, it'll give me back a maybe of 37. If we have a list that's empty, guess what we get back? Guess what safe head gives? Um, what, so, what maybe event would safe head give if we have a list that's empty? It would say, hey, take the safe head of this list. Guess what we'll get back as a maybe? If the list that we're starting with is empty, what, is it, what does safe head give us back? None. No, it gives it, yeah, nothing, nothing. It gives us back. That, that's what maybe does, right? Either it holds a value or it holds nothing. And so it gives us back nothing. That's why it's safe. It doesn't just bomb out of there. It's like, ah, I can't do it, crash, right? It, it gives us nothing. Same thing with the list of bulls, right? It, it, if, if there's a first of them, right? Then it'll give it to us. If, if the list is empty, it'll give us nothing. A pool. And, and here uh, we have a natural transformation, I would argue. How do we know that? Well, we I would say this naturality square commutes, and I want you to follow my reasoning. Remember, the idea of the naturality square is we need to be able to either operate with how as negative is lifted by the first functor and then map over to the other functor or map over to the other functor first and follow how that same morphism is lifted by that functor. And either way needs to, to go to the same, to get the same result. So let's try that. Let's suppose we have a list that has 17 as its first element. Mm -hmm. We can either Take it safe head. So if we have list of with a 17 as the first element of it, and again, maybe it is a lot, maybe it is just a, a few, or or maybe that's the only one. If we have list of 17, what do we get out if we apply safe head to it? What do we get out? The the lifted version of safe head. Lift lifted. Oh, sorry. It's safe head. It maps from list of A to maybe of A. So what do we get out? If we have a list that starts with 17, what do we get for a maybe? What's the maybe, maybe of, of 17? Yeah, maybe of 17. Yeah, sum of 17, S-O-M-E. It holds the value 17. Mm. Okay, so we got that out. And then we can map is negative on that. So if we ask, if we map is negative on maybe of 17, what do we get? Well, what sort of thing do we get? We get a maybe of bool. That's what happens when you map. Maybe knows how to map things. It's a functor. So if you map a maybe event, and you map is negative over it, and it holds 17, guess what It's what maybe of bool you get back? Maybe false. Yeah. Maybe false. Exactly. Exactly. Good. Because it's the only element there, 17, is not negative. Good. Or the element in the maybe is, is not okay alternatively so so that's maybe of 17 let's see if going the other way around the naturality square we get the same thing right so we start with this list that the first element is 17 and maybe it has a million things after it maybe it has 10 maybe it has three maybe it has zero more things but it has 17 first okay then suppose we map on that list, we map is negative on it. And we turn it from a list of ints. If we map, if we F map, if we map is negative on a list of ints, what do we get back? Remember, we're lifting. That's what list knows how to do. It knows how to lift this function so it can operate on lists. So if we have the function is negative and, and we apply it, we lift it to operate on lists, we take a list of ints whose first element is 17. What do we, and we we map this is negative over, what do we get back? A what? False. A, a, a list of bools, right. 
whose first element is what? It's false. It's false. Yeah. Exactly. Now, it could be a million long, right? If, if this list here was a million long and we map this as negative, this list of bulls is a million long, right? But the first element is false because it was 17 over here and, and that's not negative, right? Um, and then we can apply safe head of bool. So if you apply safe head to a list with a million items, but the first one is 17, what do you get? What does safe head do? It maps a list to a maybe. So what do you get? A list of A to a maybe of A. What do you get if you apply it to a list where 17, where it's false, it's the first element, and then, and then you've got a million things after it or whatever. What do you get back? You get... Uh, sum of false. Sum of false, which is the same thing we got going this way, right? This way, we got sum of false because we extracted the first one and we saw it was not negative. This way, we got sum of false because we mapped over this god-awful long list, a million length, a billion items, whatever it is, 37 items, whatever it is, you know, two items, whatever, however long it was, we mapped it over it and then we extracted Right, with safe head, and we get the same thing. That this is very powerful because it's there. It's yielding the same result. It's not that maybe it's the same as list. Of course, it's not the same. It is, you know, doesn't have a million items and it. There's only one or zero, right? But what it means to lift a function in some sense is compatible for lists and maybes, right? Um, and we could go through the same naturality square. Suppose the list was empty. Suppose the list were empty. Suppose this list of ints were empty and we do safe head. What do we get back? So we have a list of ints that's empty and we do safe head on it. What do we get back? Nothing. It's, we get back nothing. So maybe, maybe of int, nothing, but yeah. And then we map is negative on nothing. What do we get? On a, on a maybe event nothing, we map is negative on it. What do we get back? Still nothing. Nothing. Yeah. As a maybe a fool. That's right. It's nothing. Uh, it's maybe fool nothing. That's right. And that has to be the same as going this way. So we have an empty list. Suppose we map on that empty list. We do F map. We lift. For the list, we lift is negative to operate in the list. We take in an empty list of ints. <laughs> it's an empty list of ints. What do we get back by mapping is negative on it? We get back a what? Empty list. Empty list of bools, right? It's kind of a boring thing, but it's an empty list of bools. And then we suppose we do safe head on that. Guess what we get back? Nothing. Again, nothing, nothing as a bool, which is the same thing we got going this way. So you see, like this commutes, like either way you do it, it commutes. It's because, you know, the ways in which maybe lifts is negative or in some sense compatible with, in some sense consistent with, those how list does it. And again, it's not this, they're the same. Maybe is vastly less information. It's vastly more coarse grained. It maps all these different lenses start with 17 to a, a maybe of 17, you know, um, but, but, um, uh, excuse me, but it, it, it maps them all to, to things that, you know, start with, with 17. Um, uh, it, yeah. If safe head will reduce them all to, you know, maybe a sum of 17, but, but here they're, they're, they're deeply compatible. And no matter what we throw at it list-wise, we're guaranteed to have this, this naturality square uh, commute that we go either way. Now, you may think this is a very contrived example, but these examples abound. They're, they, we see them in all sorts of places. This is called nothing more than a parametrically polymorphic function. And they're extremely common in Haskell, extremely common. And every such parametrically, parametrically, um, uh, parametrically parameterized function in Haskell is guaranteed to be natural in this way. It's guaranteed. So this is not some really wacko, strange thing. 
there's an unlimited number of these functions. Not every function is this way. No, 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 no. But, but there are a huge subclass that are nice in this way. A huge subclass that define natural transformations from list to maybe, to, from you know list of A to maybe of A. Not just one, but this is one of them. I mean, this is a natural transformation. There may be other natural transformations, um, but uh, for well, for other functors, there will be. But here's the thing, and 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 you know, for yeah, for other functors, it can be. But here's the thing, um, with this natural transformation um, comes the ability for optimization, right? So, so we talked about it a little bit blithely that oh yeah, it it guarantees the same result no matter which way you go here, and that's true. But the performance cost. In a at least in a strict language, is massive, right? Of of mapping it over the entire list. Maybe it's a billion long in this day and age of big data, and then extracting the first element. If that's guaranteed to be the same, guaranteed to be identical to in its results, extracting the first element and converting that with this negative mapping is negative to that. You can imagine the performance savings by going this way compared to that one. This way might be incredibly expensive in a strict language where you're applying is negative to every element and turn in sort of a naive way compared to just extracting the first and then applying it. And what this allows you to do is to recognize opportunities for optimization amongst other things, right? We can be intelligent in a way that's guaranteed to be safe, guaranteed to be to be give the same results, but in a vastly more economical fashion by going this way rather than that one. And again, it's important to emphasize this we say that this this is um this is guaranteed to hold between ints and maybes. Um for any function here, right? This is this is a thing. Maybe it's is positive, right? This is guaranteed to hold for safe end. Maybe this is is prime. This is guaranteed to have. Maybe it's is even, or maybe it's is odd, or maybe it's you know is a collapse number or whatever. Um, you know, is in the Fibonacci sequence. Whatever your your predicate is here, going from ints to bools. A natural transformation like safehead is guaranteed to preserve this naturality square. It's not that we pick cherry picked is negative and it just holds for that and everything else it falls apart from. No, no, no. Um, if if safehead is parametrically polymorphic in Haskell, if it's a parametrically polymorphic function going from one functor to another like this, mm -hmm. then this is guaranteed to be natural. It's guaranteed to preserve this for any function over here between these two. That's incredibly powerful, right? Um, uh, type of result. So it's it's not that this is jury rigged to apply for is negative. It applies for all these different. All it has to apply for it to be count as polymorphic function for all of these. And what I'm telling you in Haskell, there's this famous paper, Theorems for Free, which shows parametrically polymorphic functions in Haskell are guaranteed to be natural transformations. They will be natural for any of these um, uh, these types of, of, of morphisms that are lifted. So you can perform this optimization without worrying that it's negative. No, 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 it's something apply for any morphism here any pure morphism here um that maps from instables it will you can perform this this uh optimization so we we, we sort of saw this um uh, i said some but this this calls just and then uh potato potato um give you a flavor of this i mean um going the other way you might think about a natural transformation. So another obvious one, right? To go from a maybe to a list. Um, if I have a maybe of 
Well, you tell me. If I have a maybe of that's just three or some three, S-O-M-E, three, I'll say just because it's less uh, homonymic. Um, so if I say it's just three, the maybe event holds just three, just the value three. And I want to do this maybe two lists. It's a polymorphic function mapping from maybe of A's to lists of A's. Maybe events here to list events. Guess what list that will create? Do you want to think? If I have just three, what list would it create? Mm -hmm. What would be in that list, do you think? I'm asking you to think, like, how, how could you define this? So it'll be a natural transformation. If I have a, a maybe just three, a maybe event that holds three, what? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, maybe event that holds just three. What list of int could I create that would be kind of the nice one? A, a one element list with three. You got it. One element list of three. And then I suppose I were to ask is negative of that, and I get back a list of bools. Like maybe it's false. A list of false. Right? Or it just has the, the false. Right. Um. Or. I could have this just of three. I could map is negative. And what do I get if I map is negative on just of three? I get what? A maybe a pool, which holds what? False. False. And then I could do maybe two list, and guess what I get? If I may, if I map a just a false, guess what I do when I do maybe two list to map it to a list of a bool? Uh, one element list with false. With false, yeah. And my point is, it's the same thing you get either way, right? This is another example of a parametrically polymorphic function. Tell me, could could you think of a of another definition that would also be be um, be natural in this sort of way? Maps from maybes to lists. Could, like creating it with a single element is is pleasing. It's kind of canonical. It's, so nice. By the way, oh, I should say what what if it's empty? What if the maybe event holds nothing? It's a maybe event with nothing in it. What would what would maybe to lists create? Do you think? Uh, empty list. An empty list. That's kind of the canonical thing to create, right? Um, and either way, you get around it, it's the same. Okay, so 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 I'm saying maybe to list that turns a maybe into a single item list is good. Is it the only possible one that would be natural? It's kind of the canonical one. So I hate to spoil it. Could you give another one that's also natural? Like a, a list where you repeat the number a bunch of times, maybe? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Repeat it twice, repeat it 10 times. Repeat it in a in a lazy language arbitrarily many times. No matter how far you go, you get that that same stinking item still. Right? Oh no, another 17, another 17, another 17, right? Um yeah, so 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 that would also work. Um uh it, some might be more efficient the one with one it would be more efficient but you could actually have different definitions of it these are not not the only ones right i mean there's a there are ones that which have kind of um kind of uh kind of uh crude crude ones where maybe i have a one functor is maybe, and the other functor is the const functor. Do you remember what the const functor does? What does the const functor do on objects? Do you remember what a const functor would do? It would it would map all objects in the source category onto what in the target category? Do you remember? It maps them all onto one object. One object. And all morphisms in the source category, what are they mapped onto? In the target, uh, 
the identity on that same object identity on that same object it has to be onto the identity yeah it has to be onto the identity it can't just be to any old self morphism no no, no. it's on it's onto the identity um that's right um and and you could you could create a kind of degenerate square here it's, it's degenerate because whereas here we had these two now you know a uh, list of int and list of bools were two separate types here but now into bool both mapped onto bool so it's they're like the same so it's like we we collapse the bottom of this square but it has to commute right like you you want to say okay if i have a, a maybe event if i start with a maybe event of say maybe just of three and then i ask um uh okay um i want to go and i want to i i have this polymorphic function that is nothing it just takes a look at the end or take a takes a look at the maybe and it says true if it's nothing so it takes a look at a maybe of a say maybe event and it says true if it's empty maybe event um uh, in other words if it's nothing false if it if it has just of something or maybe it has a maybe a bool and it's a true if it's empty and, uh, or and false if it's not nothing okay so if i have maybe event say just of three and what what is is nothing return what bool does it return it says just of three and i ask is nothing on it what what do i get back false false that's right by the way this is just a just a polymorphic function and maps from parametric and polymorphic function and that's from maybe event to kind of identity of bool anyway it, it can imagine imagine this it returns false alternatively i could i could map i'm just doing the size of this naturality square alternatively i could map is negative on maybe of 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 n and oh sorry is yeah is negative on it um and and uh i'm gonna uh, map it on maybe event which holds just three and what what will i get back i'll get back maybe a bool that has what in it what will i get in it if i map is oh. negative mm-hmm uh, false false and then i map uh, and then i map it with is nothing do what do i get true or false it's nothing on this maybe a bool if it has just false and it does is is nothing true or false 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 that's right and I, so i get the same thing either way in other words look i mean so the, just to be clear here, this is nothing is the parametric is the not is the component of the natural transformation here, a component of the natural transformation there, right? It translates between the two functors. This one's kind of the constant functor. So you can either you can either translate first and then map, which is the identity map, or you can map and then translate between the two functors. Either way you go. Heck, if you have a maybe, if you if you map is negative, you map any other any other morphism, right? Onto a maybe event that goes to a maybe a bool, you're gonna preserve whether or not it's empty, right? If it started as empty, it's gonna end up empty. If it started with something in it, you're gonna get something in it as the result. And and so you could either just say, does it have anything in it? In the first, it's guaranteed to be the same as mapping it to your heart's content and then and then asking if it is nothing there. There's no point mapping and then extracting, asking is nothing. You might as well do it on the original. In other words, when you map it, you, you preserve the property as to whether it's empty or not, whether it's nothing, right? So you might as well not do this extra work of mapping it. Might as well just ask if it's is nothing at first. So 
again, this should whisper to you of optimizations, just like this first one did, right? And like recognizing that there's this natural transformation means you can have quicker, more efficient, more sensible, more, more intelligent, more parsimonious, um, much more economical ways of, of achieving the same goal. And they're guaranteed to be the same. And in Haskell, any parametrically polymorphic function, say Fed is one of them, is negative, or sorry, maybe to list as another, is nothing. It's it's natural adaptation. I'm, I'm sort of uh, simplifying the situation because you need identity of bool as a as a functor. But in any case, any of those are guaranteed to be natural transformations. So you can maybe start to get an understanding of why in languages that are that are that are functional languages, all these opportunities for optimization abound. If you can identify these category theoretic foundations for these things, that like any parametrically polymorphic function is guaranteed to be natural, it just opens up this huge variety of different optimizations that can be uh, performed. We can do something with make nothing, et cetera. Now, um, in, in another lecture on this topic, you can find me sort of expounding on this. But um, uh, I mentioned earlier that natural transformations, the, the, the existence of a natural transformation from functor F to functor G. Remember, it's not symmetric, right? Like you can have a natural transformation from F to G, but not vice versa. It's not like F and G are in the same equivalence class. You know, it's, it's symmetric both ways. No, no, no. It's from F to G. If there's a natural transformation from F to G, um, I said it was a very strong condition. It's a very, you know, it's it's very common in, in some level, like, like in parametrically polymorphic functions. But it's a very powerful, powerfully informative thing. And it it turns out that because this has to hold for all all of these morphisms in the source category, all of these different morphisms, um, that they have to preserve this, this naturality square. There's this incredible, um, inc it, it really sort of means that these two functors um, have this very strong relationship to one another and how they preserve things. And and in a way, the existence of this natural transformation means that we can specify um the the natural transformation can be can be specified in in a uh, quite compact way because uh, there's not many of them. There's there's only a very limited number of these natural transformations. Um, so it's a, it's a very, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into it here, but it turns out that um, knowing about uh, these, that there is a natural transformation gives very little wiggle room for for what that natural transformation could be. Um, so I, I want to give you a little bit of exercises about this. Um, um, so we've seen some of these, like maybe to list. We we saw this, right? If just X um, consists of that, we saw this as a natural transformation. Um, uh, what if um, I'm, I'm going to ask some some other possibilities. Some of these are more um, are more sort of uh, uh, straightforward ones to think about. Um, how about val to list this? Um, so so imagine a functor um, uh, that maps. You see, identity functor maps types to types, right? Um, um, uh, so, so remember, in natural transformation, we're providing this Rosetta Stone going between two 
phone codes, right? This may be to list one from a maybe of A to a list of A. Those are two functors. Maybe of A, you'll call it F, and, and list of A, we'll call it G. Valta list is, is a map between two functors. By the way, we sometimes write natural transformations this way with these sort of double headed arrows. So, Valta list, um, uh, the second one is a, is a list of A, but the first of them is an identity natural transformation. It's just mapping A onto A, okay? Type int, map to type int, okay? Um, and what I'm asking is, um, we're gonna imagine imagine a sort of naturality square here, right? Or maybe we'll envision it like this. Naturality square, where val to list is this one. It's, it's, it's a val to list of, of A, it maps an A up here, that's the sort of identity um, functor, maps that onto to lists of A. So, the question is, is this a natural transformation? If we had, you know, int maps to list of int, um, and bool maps to the component for it will be something going to lists of bool, right? Um, uh, and, and basically its job in life is given an int, it'll turn a single element list that contains that int. Given a bool, it can return a single element list that contains the bool, a list of bools. Mm -hmm. um, and mapping, F mapping, lifting of the identity of, of F, lifting that with the identity functor will just, well, well you tell me, um, if, if uh, this is the identity functor up here, if capital F is the identity functor, so int is mapped to int, bool is mapped to bool, what do you think F being is negative is mapped to? What do you think that's mapped to when we map it with the identity functor? What is is negative mapped to in F if we hit it with the identity functor? So again, I'm just I'm just going through this. This is the identity functor. We're mapping here. We're mapping from the maybe functor to the list functor. Here we're mapping also to the list functor. The natural transformation tells us how to translate to the list functor from what? From the identity functor. What does the identity functor do when it's applied to objects? Well, it what, leaves it as the same object. Int is mapped to int. Bool is mapped to bool. What does it do when it's applied to a function, or to a morphism? What does the identity functor do on morphisms? If it we apply it to F, what does it map it to? Identity, folks. What does it map F to? What does it map F to? When you apply identity to it. Uh oh. Ladies and gentlemen, if you apply identity to int, it gives you an int. If you apply identity to bool, it gives you a bool. If you apply identity to a morphism, it gives you the same morphism. Mm -hmm. We're mapping has to hask here. Gives you the same morphism. If it's is negative, it turns into is negative. This is int bool, it is negative. So, so we're going to be translating from that to maps between list events and list of bools, where we map it, map is negative over this list of events to get a list of bools. And the question is, is this val to list a natural transformation. Does this square commute for all of these? We can either go is negative from an int to get a bool, and then we can map over to a single element list consisting of that bool 
or we could map over from int to a single element int list. And then we could map that by lifting the function is negative to get a list of bools. Is that going to give the same result? Anyone? Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's... It will. It's yes. It will. So this is a natural transformation. It's a natural transformation. Um, mapping from the identity functor to the list functor. It's a, that's what this is. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, so it, it is a natural transformation. That's correct. Okay. Um, now, how about, how about if you, how if someone says, how about list to val? Given a, a list, so F now, capital F, is going to be the list functor. So we're going to have list of ints. Int is going to map to list of ints. Bool is going to map to list of bools. F here is going to map, is going to be the F map. And mapping is, say, is negative from list of ints to get list of bools. So that's what we're going from. Remember, uh, our natural transformation is Rosetta Stone to map it to a it tells how to map from one functor, how one functor maps things to how the other functor maps things. What is the other functor? Well, it's just the identity functor. So this will be int and this will be bool. And what we'd like to do is say list to val. So given a list of type A, return the value at the head of the list. That's what we'd like to do. Given any list of type A, where the elements are any list where you know a list of in, list of bools and its job is to to extract the first of them and and so list of ends we get an in list of bools we get a bool is that natural can anyone see a problem with that I can't see. Well, what could go well, wrong? Uh huh. If, uh huh. Yeah, I'm not sure, but if it doesn't have any uh, elements, head, exactly, um... exactly. If this were maybe, this were maybe, it's no problem. Maybe event, but the problem is that we can't handle an empty list, and so if we have an empty list. If here we have an empty list, right? Um, then we're not going to be able to extract this results, right? Um, and we won't get any ends. <laughs> It'll blow up, right? And we can't convert that, can't map over that to get a, a, a bool. We're not going to be able to get a bool. <laughs> we won't even get an end. This way, we can map to uh, an empty list of, of, of ints. We can map to an empty list of bools. And then we could try to extract. It'll blow up. We won't be able to even get a bool. But we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to fulfill this square commuting because we can't even get around this uh, either way. Um, um, Right. Um, so, okay. Uh, I'm going to see. Um, we already had this. Uh, right. Um, mm, mm, I'm, I'm trying to. Um, uh, right. Okay. Um, uh right um mm, mm, um okay um 
How about this one here? Pair, pair to list. Given a, a pair of value of the same type, A. It's not, it doesn't mean the same exact value. It could be three and seven. They're both ints. It returns a singleton list consisting of the first item of the pair. Would this be natural? So, so here we have the 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 first functor is one that maps ints to to pairs of int and int, maps bools to pairs of bool and bool, mm -hmm. um, and the other functor maps list you know uh, list to list of in, uh, or ints to list of ints bools to list of bools. Okay. Um, so the question is, would this be a natural transformation? Pair to list, uh, where it only extracts, say, the, the first value. So suppose we started with three and seven. Um, would this would this uh, be a, a naturality square? Would it would it commute for any function? We a, a lift? Imagine a lifting applied to the pair applies applies the, the function you're lifting, say is negative to each element of the pair. So if you have is negative and you have a three and a seven and you and you map is negative onto it, you get false and false. But if you had three and minus seven, you lift is negative onto it, you get you get false and you get true. Right? Okay, so would that be natural if we if we try to map it onto this um, um, we or that uh, paradelist is, is is claiming to be this Rosetta Stone from going between these this functor and 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 this functor uh, so to speak it's a way of translating would that be natural. Uh, yes, it is natural. It is natural. It is natural. That's exactly right. It's a it's a natural transformation. Let's suppose we changed it. So, given a pair of values of the same type a, two ends, two bulls, it has a it, it's not a singleton list anymore. It's it's a it's a list consisting of two items. You know, it's a list consisting of the first and and then the second. Um, would that be would that be natural? Uh, it's not empty, so it it can be. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well done. Let me let me ask this. Suppose it, suppose that we had something called like pair to swapped list, where it takes in a pair of values, say three and seven, and it returns it returns a, a list consisting of seven and three. Hmm. Seven and seven and three. Um, would would that be natural? So it converts it to a list, but it's in the kind of reversed order. Would that be natural? I think yes. The answer is yes. Because we could either start with a list of ends, or sorry, a pair of ends. And whatever thing we ask of it, right? We could map is prime over them. We could add, map is negative over them. We could add, map is even over them. We could map is odd over them. Whatever we map over is the call ads number. We could get a list, uh, a pair of bulls, right? Whatever we have over this pair of ends, get a pair of pools. Yeah, any any function from into pool, lift it to operate on this pair, get that pair of pools. And we can then run this kind of funky version pair to swap list and get, get those two pools put in the reversed order. Yeah, okay. It's kind of funky, but it's okay. It's okay, right? Um, or 
we could take those a pair, right? We could map it over with the natural transformation to to this int list where the two were in the reversed order, and then right this int list, and then map is negative or is odd or is even or is prime or is collets or whatever onto that and and get them and you you've got the right order either way you 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 swap them this way here you swap them this way and then you applied it it's the same same thing you've got this very nice consistent mapping between these two functors with this natural transformation it achieves this way of going from one functor to the other that is true to both to how you lift the all these different morphisms any morphism from into bull it's gonna preserve how it maps these things in a way that stays consistent right um and we're not taking advantage of all the function the all the the range the dynamic range of lists they could go on for much longer but what we're doing is very consistent and we get the same results either way we do this and it's a natural transformation and again from an optimization standpoint we could exploit that if we wanted to do so um in this case it might be fairly minor optimizations but you could imagine you want to extract the first of them and instead of going through this whole song and dance of mapping over both of them and and then you know uh and swapping them uh, mapping over the first you 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 uh in in extracting the first you can act just extract the the second one from the get-go and map over that or what have you the point is natural transformations give this this beautiful consistency between these that's guaranteed for any function here and, and and if you've got this natural transformation it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing between them and in category theory ladies and gentlemen um eugenia chang talks about you know uh, how we're much more careful thoughtful judicious about how we use this notion of sameness instead of just forcing everything to be equal sometimes we may ask for uh you know isomorphism only we're not just using the hammer of equality to say that's the only notion of sameness that's worth anything everything else is is useless no no, no. we have these more refined notions and, and one of them is is this notion of of isomorphism but an, another is this notion of naturality there's this natural or sorry natural transformation from one to the other um and there's a lot of things in category theory that once you relax them to allow for a natural transformation um the, the instead of even isomorphism um you can get a lot of insights and, and actually get a lot of power so with monads so a lot of things about talking with you about lists and pairs or, or maybe um you know with trees etc these are actually monads um and monads have these beautiful um beautiful ways of um of being manipulated and they, they they reflect sort of a certain uh consistency in the structure between categories it's not an equivalence of categories but it allows um allows for capturing these relationships through these what are called adjunctions and it turns out these natural natural transformations um, provide this this way of capturing a relationship between things that's it, that's often very very insightful but more relaxed and then there's these things called natural isomorphisms which are stronger than an isomorphism it also is it's natural in this sense that we can 
you know, map over and going one um, in the map, or, or we could uh, map it first and then go over, et cetera. So um, natural transformations are very, very beautiful. Now, we don't have uh, time for it. We're already over, over time here. But one thing that Eugenia Cheng, you know, talks about in this chapter is that just as you know early on i urged recognizing that it's useful to go from thinking about how a natural transformation is defined with components and maps to thinking about it as a map between functors where you might have a functor category where each object is a functor from category c to category d and across the entire category you have these different functors from C to D. There's this one from C to D, that one from C to D, this one from C to D, that one, or C and D are categories, right? And so there's different ways of mapping from C to D, different different functors, different structure preserving ways of mapping C into D. These are all objects in the category and the morphisms between them are natural transformations. They have these structure preserving mappings between functors. If we have that, um, a natural, no, no pun intended, but a, a, a sort of natural question that comes up, a sort of very um, understandable question, is can we compose them? How do we compose them? And it turns out that there's two ways to compose them. And this, again, points to the higher dimension of reasoning that's coming in. We have objects. We have functors, or sorry, we have categories. We have functors, which map from category to category. That's another dimension. And then we have natural transformations to map functors to functors. And there's two ways that come in here. There's a vertical way that compose natural transformations kind of in this end-to-end, -end, uh, or this way that's... Uh, uh, so, so we have a mapping from C to D. I shouldn't say end to end here. Um, uh, it, it composes it like this. So we might have F through a natural transformation alpha can be translated into G, right? Structure preserving translation between functors. That's what we have, right? The human to a dog that we started with, right? A head of human to a head of a dog, arm of human to arm of dog, neck of human to neck of dog, et cetera. And then we have another transformation from, from that functor to a different functor. We call each of them maybe alpha and then beta. And then we have a natural transformation that's the vertical composition that goes from F to H. So if, if we have this kind of way of translating F functor F, think of that as an object in the category to functor G, some morphism from F to G. And we have another morphism from G to H in this category. Each object is a, is a functor from C to D, from C to D. And we have this way of composing them. So F, uh, you know, the F is one morphism, G, they're end to end in this category. And we got something that now can go from, uh, from F to, to H, right? between those two objects, yeah, because we have these natural transformations, these morphisms end to end that can be composed. So this is vertical transmission, oh, sorry, transmission, vertical, not, sorry, vertical, uh, vertical composition, natural transformations. I, uh, it's been too long a, a day. Um, and, um, and so this uh, vertical um, composition actually comes up um, within uh, software engineering. So for example, we might compose a uh, pair to list, we saw that one, with safe head, right? Uh, which goes from a list to a maybe. We might compose those as natural, trans sorry, natural transformations to get something that goes from a pair, so this, to a maybe, right? That's a vertical composition. We have one natural transformation from pairs to lists, another one from lists to maybes, 
Remember, each of these things is uh, maybe list and pairs. These are associated with functors. And, and we can get a composition of them that go from A to A to maybe. It's a very, very natural notion from a programming standpoint. And, and it has a kind of nice diagram that kind of makes sense. We have this component from FA to GA called alpha sub A. Remember that? It's labeled by its source object and C, right? And then we have another one from GA to HA, also labeled by its source A, right? Um, and we could compose those morphisms. Remember, any two morphisms in a category, N to N, are guaranteed to have a composition. And we can get a morphism from F to H, right? It's kind of a, a natural notion, not much as hopefully this kind of makes sense to you, right? Um, that's vertical composition in this kind of way. Now, horizontal composition requires some more thinking and more diagrammatic um, care in, in describing it, but it's also very, very useful. Mm. Um, so here we're, we're thinking of F and as having a natural transformation to F prime going from C to D. And then... And we've got, and then we've got, those are from C to D. And then we've got this other category, E. And we have things going from D to E. Translate between, or this natural transformation. Mm. Um, beta. So we've got different categories. Some functors from C to D that we know how to go between with one natural transformation, alpha. We have other functors going from category D to category E, we have this natural transformation between. And then that's a natural question. Now in the other dimension, can, hey, can we can we go from C to E, right? Can we go span these sort of ways? And, and heck, um, we know how to, to, to compose functors. G after F is a functor from C to E and, and G prime after F prime is a functor there. And we we needed this way of sort of translating from that into this. And that's that's this horizontal transformation. And it uses a different notation. Here we're using this kind of open circles, as if it's composition. Um, whereas here we use this closed circle, a sort of dot, uh, as composition this way. So these are vertical versus horizontal. And it's it's speaking about the two-dimensional character, often when we're dealing with, for example, with uh, two categories or with double categories, we have horizontal morphisms and vertical morphisms, and we can compose in these different ways or squares or what have you. Um, and horizontal requires kind of more thinking, okay, we got this C to D and and there's our naturality square that's preserved. And we got D to E, which goes over. And all these naturality cubes, they all, all are preserved. Um, and uh, that's a, um, it turns out from a function, uh, a, a functional programming perspective, it's quite useful. And then Eugenia Chang in, her, in the chapter you know, talks about these fish diagrams where we have kind of common ones here where where these two are the same and then we have just these two, et cetera. Um, and we have this kind of uh, special case with, with this and we can do it in the reverse uh, direction um, here. Um, anyway, uh, there's a lot more to, to learn about and I don't expect you to absorb this. This is quite you know, requires a lot of, of thinking, thinking this stuff through. But it is good to have this notion. Functors, the structure preserving mappings and natural transformations of these structure preserving. When we have two functors going from category C to category D, both, both of them go from C to D. Natural transformations provide this way of translating one of those functors into the other. That if you can do it, it's natural, if you if there is such a natural transformation, it's very it tells us that 
there's this that there's this consistency we can preserve structure and going between them there's these ways of, of, they could play nicely together just as we saw with you know safe had list and maybe can play nicely together uh or maybe maybe to list um you know maybe going to a list can play nicely together um and we saw with you know uh pair to list for example these are ways of of helping of of, of getting these things to sort of play nicely together be consistent at some level um so natural transformations are conceptually demand um, but you know one step at a time um, be patient with yourself and that's a good lesson for category theory in general you know, be compassionate with yourself recognize this tremendous depth here it's okay to be confused it's normal to be confused and in some ways it's good as eugenia chang says to show you you're confused at first because it means you're 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 um you have a sense that things have to add up and you're trying to trying to make sense of it how it all fits together in your mind and that's a good thing it's nothing to be ashamed about i've gone through that i do go through that you know on an ongoing basis and you have to be be comfortable being vulnerable be comfortable being recognizing that you know you're, you're gonna understand this much and there's gonna be all these things that you don't understand yet and and that's okay it's, it's kind of uniquely uh, an experience with category theory that everyone, everyone goes through, um, and 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 will go through, and and yet, if you can, you know, much much of the art, much of the need here, is maintaining your motivation and maintaining your sense of self confidence, because these are tricky concepts, but they grow on, and over time, as you get exposed to more and more. These things that seem so mysterious at first, maybe it's natural transformations to you right now, start to start to seem very, forgive the word, natural. They start to seem, of course, it has to be that way because it all fits together in your mind and you come to appreciate more and more. And things will be off-putting at first. Things will be confusing. But don't let your doubting uh, about yourself get in the way of that um you're you're putting up barriers to yourself if you if you if you uh you know treat your lack of immediate understanding as somehow unusual or problematic or um uh, something that's to be ashamed about it's nothing to be ashamed about it's 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 a point of vulnerability and it and it and it comes you know over time you'll you acquire more and more but it takes it takes you know trying your trying at it examining it from different angles trying to find different explanations of it talking with people who are a little bit at least further along that path and fortunately in our group you know we do have these really excellent collaborators who are far far beyond my level and and um who are really excellent in terms of offering advice and, and understanding um this is a kind of a you know, a challenge that that extends over years, over over decades, um, even. But the field is evolving in ways that create these new constructs that are really fascinating and powerful. And what we're seeing in, in category theory is this unique flourishing now of how it's being applied in more and more powerful ways, in uniquely powerful ways to these very important areas for our labs dedication to making a difference to the human condition and category theory has this uh, depth but this dynamic range that's absolutely incredible um there's many topics that we haven't touched in this course uh, because uh you know they didn't feature prominently uh within this book but which i will look forward to exploring with you uh in in coming months um and in some cases in coming weeks i do hope that those here will will uh join the discussion group which is coming along um in parallel to this course 
uh, to discuss, for example, the chapter on the Yoneda embedding um, or the chapter on higher dimensions that forms the final chapter of the book. But, you know, we'll, I think we'll see lots of other, other opportunities too, to learn about important constructs, um, algebras and co-algebras, um, monads, which have, like algebras, incredibly common use in, in functional programming, but also central to, to sort of understanding of many structures like similarity of categories is characterized by adjunctions. We will also be seeing polynomial functors and lenses, types of optics that are very powerful constructs. Um, uh, we'll be likely uh, learning something about about vibrations and what are called op, op vibrations, um, which which are really powerful. And the Yoneda dilemma, may, which, that is the subject of a chapter, may come in and useful. Um, uh, there's there's many other spheres of application too, in modeling and in software engineering, which uh, may bring up other topics like pro functors, which we've sort of skirted around. And in fact, we've kind of come close to touching them, but um, we didn't have the, the time or didn't want to distract from the book content. But if you can join you know, our, our ongoing um, uh, discussions in our subgroups, uh, we're going to have them this semester on agent-based modeling applications of category theory, um, on stock and flow. And, and it's other system dynamics uh, categories like associated with causal loop diagrams and system structure diagrams. Also for categorical probability and statistics, which turned out to be an incredibly interesting and powerful area directly relevant to Seffel's work and taking things like the particle filter or particle Markov chain Monte Carlo into the categorical domains. Um, and we're going to be having these these subgroups. Um, there'll also be some on polynomial functors um, that we'll be trying to advance. And I would invite you to join as many of them as you'd like. I'll, for some of you, I may request it. Uh, others, I hope to make you aware of it and would welcome you if you if you'd like to join. Okay. Um, because we'll be having a lot going on. And sometimes, most of the time we'll be within our group, I think, but sometimes we'll be potentially people like John Bies will join. Uh, Zhu Shen Liu is interested in, in the categorical probability and statistics side. And we'll be, uh, we'll be on a learning journey that will be assisted by others as well. Um, so, um, you know, um, the, the race goes to the slow and steady, um, to the uh, uh, the ones who conserve their energy, conserve their motivation, conserve their recognition of needing to consume things one step at a time. Um, uh, and you'll find yourself climbing the mountain before you know it and have quite beautiful views beyond even those uh, we've, we've enjoyed already uh, from this book. So that's where we're going. Um, it's been uh, an enormous uh, pleasure to have you along for this course. Um, uh, I will be with me back in town here. I'll be in my office the next three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'll also be um, happy. I know some of you are still working on your projects and I'd be happy to meet with you uh, if you're, you're interested in doing that um, uh, to talk things uh, through. There's no giant hurry for those things, but um, you know, you can have more time, just let me know and and let me know how I could help. If it would be useful to meet, I'm glad to do that, okay? So with those comments, I think I'll stop the